and let her. Uh, and just before Alana starts, everyone, I just want to ask that you all mute your microphones. At the, if you have any questions that pop up during the presentation, please put them in the chat box and I'll keep track of them. So at the end of Alana's presentation, we can tackle questions that have come up and the ones that you sent in in advance. Okay, thanks everybody. Sorry, Alana, go for it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I did get two questions ahead of time. So I've incorporated those into the presentation. Uh, one came through this afternoon. So Maureen said she'll make sure um, that you guys read that out at the end. And I have probably a little bit more slides than we will need to cover. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we leave some time because uh, I really want to get to your questions since you guys have spent um, some time to be with us today. So let's uh, I'll share my screen. All right, everybody can see that okay? Uh, perfect, I see some thumbs up. So uh, today we're gonna talk about moving uh, towards better health. Uh, like I said, I am a physiotherapist, so I'll speak to it a little bit from um, my physiotherapy lens. And um, I'll touch on some different breathing exercises, but just ways that we can use exercise uh, to make ourselves healthier, to make our lungs healthier. get to the second slide we're good so i thought we'd start out uh just with learning a little bit about diaphragmatic breathing so i know alexa and Lindsay and the uh, already talked a little bit about different types of lung disease reviewed in a past presentation like what is copd what is asthma what is interstitial lung disease so i thought i wouldn't go over what they've already covered um but i wanted to focus a little bit uh on some of the important things about breathing uh, and I thought we'd just settle in uh, by doing some diaphragmatic breathing together. So our diaphragm is that main breathing muscle that sits uh, right below our rib cage. And uh, some people are really good at using it. Uh, some people uh, tend to breathe more from the top of their chest using those accessory breathing muscles. So just want you to uh, start out by putting one hand just at the bottom of your rib cage, kind of on your belly, and one hand just below your collarbones, and just kind of follow your own breathing as you breathe in through your nose, if you can, and out through your mouth. Where do you guys feel that coming from? So some people might really feel their top hand as they breathe in, rising up because they're breathing what we call apically, breathing really from the top uh, of their chest. Uh, ideally, we're breathing a little bit more from where our bottom hand is so that our belly rises as we breathe in and that our belly button goes back towards our spine as we blow out. I thought we could play around a little bit um, with some different little cues you can do or different things you can do to facilitate a good, a good deep breath. Uh, so one thing I'd like everybody to try is just to sit, and I don't know if you guys can see me kind of in the little box on the side of your screen, um, but if you can sit kind of slouched, and maybe even sit with your, your legs together. And now try taking a deep breath in that position as you're seated kind of slouched. Does it feel like your belly has a lot of room to expand kind of in that, in that posture? I, I can see a few heads on the screen shaking no. Um, and now what I want you to try is, can you get into a position where you just have those natural, as natural as you can curves in your spine? So our spine has a natural S shape and we want just that little bit of a hollow to our low back, maybe, uh, especially if you have a little bit of a belly, maybe you sit, uh, I call it like a man on the bus because I used to ride the bus in Ottawa a lot, <laughs> sit with your legs a little bit apart, so not so ladylike. And then try uh, taking a deeper breath in that position with that nice little curve to our spine, a little bit more upright and our legs a little bit more apart. Does that make you feel like you have a little bit more room for that belly to expand?
So sometimes if you're thinking about um, ways to get in a deep breath at home, maybe it's because you're working on clearing some secretions, or maybe you're at the hospital um, and you're in a hospital bed and you're trying to get in, get in a deep breath, um, paying attention a little bit to what our posture is like, whether you need to raise that, that head of the bed at the hospital, um, whether you need to get into a bit more upright posture at home, that might help you get in, um, get in a deeper breath, get a more diaphragmatic breath in. The other thing we can try is we can use our arms as a bit of a cue. Uh, so we know that when we open up our arms, we tend to promote uh, a nice good inhale. And then as we close them, internal rotation as we exhale. So you're in that nice tall posture, a little bit of a hollow to your back. Now, as you breathe in, I want you to open your arms up. And as you exhale, bring those arms in. So some of you might know or do this exercise along with Jill at some of our classes. This is often what she uses in part of the warm up. Now, for those that have COPD, and we'll touch on it a little bit uh, more as we go along, you may want to be puckering your lips a little bit, pursing your lips like you're blowing out a candle uh, as you do that, that exhale so that we can prolong that exhale, create a little back pressure to keep those damaged airways open a little bit longer. So it's not shown to be as effective in um, people with interstitial lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, but it is an effective technique. Um, for a lot of people with COPD, especially in the more advanced stages. So give that a try. We're breathing in through our nose if we can, opening up our arms, and we're exhaling out through pursed lips. Now there's another cue you can add in to get, uh, to cue your breath, which is where your eyes are looking. So it turns out when we look up, we automatically cues us to take a breath in. And if we look down, it'll help with our exhale. So now we're gonna be in that nice tall posture, legs open, we're gonna be using our arms. We're gonna look up as we inhale and we're gonna look, uh, just gaze down. So you don't actually have to move your whole head up and down, but just gazing with your eyes um, up and down as you take some breaths. So whenever you feel ready, just follow your own breath. Nice breath in through our nose. Opening up the arms, looking up, and then exhale, gazing down. So looking up, and exhale, gazing down. So it's, it's pretty neat to see that uh, we can use our eyes even just to cue ourselves to get uh, a little bit better, uh, deeper inhale. So I hope that kind of got us all calm. If you're rushing to get on the screen, um, brought you some big breaths and uh, hopefully not too much coughing if anybody got some air in behind those secretions, but we're all muted, so it'd be fine. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, different types of exercise today, um, other than just breathing exercises. Uh, we know that along with our medication, that exercise and physical activity play a key role in the treatment of our, of our lung condition. Um, we know from the research that regular exercise can help us better control our shortness of breath, increase our tolerance uh, to effort, increase our strength, help us get better control of our anxiety, increase our confidence uh, in our own abilities and improve overall quality of life. So it'd be great if there was a pill that could do all that, uh, probably, uh, probably be doing very well on the stock market. Uh, but unfortunately, we actually have to put in the work for exercise. Uh, there, isn't, uh, there isn't a magic pill, but exercise is like medicine, in my opinion. The other thing, uh, the other reason it's important to keep active uh, is really to avoid uh, this downward spiral. Hopefully, you guys can all see that slide OK. Um, so what can often happen uh, when people are breathless is that they avoid activity because they don't like that feeling of breathlessness. And so we become, we become inactive, we sit around more, lie around more. Uh, so, and when we're inactive, 
we become deconditioned, we get a reduced exercise capacity. So the next time we try to do something, we're, we're even more breathless or we can do less. So we decide, you know, so we do less because we feel like we can do less because we're more short of breath. And we get on this really bad um, downward spiral, which reduces our quality of life. Uh, so what we want to do is break that cycle, um, this downward spiral. We want to avoid it um, by finding, finding ways uh, where we can be active, where we can maintain that heart and lung conditioning the best we can. Uh, you know, whether if we have two athletes beside each other and, and one is fitter than the other, one's going to be able to run more stairs during that BC lung stair challenge they have every year with the firefighters um, because of that increased fitness. And it's the same for people with lung disease. When you have better fitness, um, you're going to be a little bit less breathless. So we can, we can still, even though uh, we're experiencing some, um, some or a lot of breathlessness, we can find ways to improve our, our heart and lung function, improve our aerobic capacity. Uh, a starting point might be just to be more physically active. So reducing that sedentary time, that time where we're spending more time sitting, uh, increasing our light physical activity. Uh, we know that low intensity physical activity reduces the risks of hospitalization in people with COPD. And we can try to increase our step count. So the number of steps we take in our day uh, we know that those that take um, more than 4,000 steps in a day uh, versus less than 4,000, uh, we see people taking more than 4,000 um, living longer, uh, people with COPD, so decreased mortality. Uh, and that uh, in some studies, they found that people that are doing 5,000 uh, steps a day um, have fewer exacerbations of their lung condition. So it's, uh, it's good to be getting increased step counts. And those numbers there where it says 25 minutes, 22 minutes, 750 steps, I didn't pull those um, out of the air. Uh, they came from a study uh, in the journal of the COPD Foundation, um, looking at differences in sedentary time, light physical activity, and steps. Uh, associated with better quality of life in people with um, with COPD, and those were those were the numbers um, that they came up with from the study. So they found that decreasing sedentary time by 25 minutes, increasing light physical activity by about 22 minutes per day, um, is associated with less shortness of breath um, and fatigue, and increasing uh, step count by about 750 steps per day associates with both physical and emotional emotional quality of life in patients with advanced COPD. So pretty cool that we can have some targets of where we might be aiming for um, in increasing our step counts. So what we want to do is try to make movement movement a habit. Uh, anybody use a step counter just by show of hands? Uh, so there's lots of different, different types of um, step counters out there. There's a basic um, pedometer, which has a little magnet. It's usually just a really small device, a little square, has a little magnet inside, and it's usually worn on our waistband um, so that every time there's just a little bit of movement by your hip, it counts a step. So these are the kinds that um, you might see given out in cereal boxes. They've done that in the past. Um, our, when we have walk with our doc day in Vernon, they were giving out those small pedometers. Uh, so they only, and they only generally cost a couple of dollars to pick up. Um, the, they are not quite as sensitive as using something like a smartwatch or your phone app um, to track your steps. Because if you hold the pedometer and just shake it around, it's going to start counting your steps. So if you, you know, put it in your purse and had somebody, you know, just carrying that around. Um, it's going to be counting steps, even though you're, you're not stepping, but it can, we do use them at our pulmonary rehab program sometimes, um, to get people an idea of their, their step counts. Um, just having it, having it on their waistband, um, and getting an idea of some of the common things they do, how many steps they're getting in a day. 
I've had people do that a number of times over the years. And what I find is if you live in a smaller place, like maybe an apartment, a uh, trailer, um, a smaller home, and you, you don't leave the house much, you maybe only get up to go to the bathroom, um, you get up maybe to make your meals, um, those small, you know, those things during the day that people were getting between two and 3,000 steps a day, a lot of the people that I was seeing. Um, and so people needed to do some purposeful activity in their day, um, whether that's dancing to one song, whether that's doing a little marching after you brush your teeth at the kitchen counter, whether that was, you know, taking a small walk with your dog, uh, instead of waiting while your um, spouse goes through the grocery store, um, going in and just grabbing the cart and doing a couple of aisles, even if you weren't the one doing the shopping. Um, so it just takes that, that little bit uh, to get that step count uh, up a little bit. It's good to incorporate standing or movement breaks uh, into our day. Uh, so we used to have natural breaks and things like we would have, you know, a commercial and a show. Um, and now things like Netflix and stuff like that, they, they want to capture our attention and they just keep throwing one video after the other um, at us without, without any breaks in the, in the programming. Um, so it gets harder to have those external cues. We don't have to get up to change the channel anymore like we had to when I was a kid. And, uh, so some of those standing or movement breaks have been uh, uh, taken out of our life. So we might have to put them back in. We might want to set a timer on our watch or you might have, if you have a, a watch that counts steps, it might have a move alert and tells you when you've been sitting for longer than 30 minutes. It tells you to get going, do a little bit of movement to reset the timer. Uh, you could set a timer on your stove or your microwave before you, um, you know, sit down to do the crosswords or be on the computer or, or knit or whatever it is that you like to spend um, time seated doing uh, so that you have to get up and go shut off that timer um, in 30 minutes time. Uh, setting an alarm on your, your smartphone and just leave it just out of, out of reach or as a cue to get up and move around a little bit when that alarm goes off. Um, so. Uh, if you find that you just accidentally, all of a sudden an hour has gone by, an hour and a half has gone by and you haven't, haven't got up, you've spent the time seated, maybe you need um, some sort of external cue to help, uh, help remind you to get up. Maybe drink a lot of water if uh, you're allowed, if you don't have any restrictions as far as heart problems, because uh, that makes you have to get up to go to the bathroom, which is a great way to get in some steps and gets your hydration, which is good for your secretions as well. Uh, so the other thing we wanna do is just build movement into our everyday, um, which they say is what uh, life is like and what they call the blue zone. So uh, National Geographic studied the areas of the world where there were the most people living to 100 with a good quality of life. And they found in those areas, um, movement was just kind of part of their everyday. It was just built into the way of life in Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, Icaria, Greece, um, and two other places uh, in the world. So if we can try to build movement into our everyday, like in those blue zones, uh, we're all gonna be a little bit healthier. So I thought we'd take a little movement break before I go on to the rest of the slides. And since I don't know if it's safe for everybody where they're at to, stand up. I thought we'd just uh, do a little movement break in, in the chair. So maybe just have your feet uh, touching the floor and just go up and down with those feet. If you feel safe standing, you can stand up. We're just bringing the feet kind of up and down the way I'm doing with my hands. You can put those wrists up and down. Be breathing in through our nose and out through pursed lips. Good, maybe a little march step, maybe pumping those arms. And you can go at your own pace, depending how you're feeling today. You might move slowly, might move more quickly. We know that Jill reminded us in some of the exercise classes, the more body parts you're moving, the more taxing it is. So if you want it less taxing, you could move just the legs or just the arms. You want it more taxing, we move more body parts, we move bigger, bigger amplitudes, and we move quicker. Those are ways to make it 
more taxing. Good, and then let's maybe just reach up just what feels comfortable for you. Breathing in, exhaling as we come down. Good, don't want anybody to fall asleep while I'm chatting. Since I don't get to get feedback from all of you, I've got to make sure we all stay awake. All right, speaking of being awake, uh, Canada has put out uh, new, new in October of 2020, 24 hour movement guidelines um, for, they had them before for children, uh, and now they've come out with some for adults 18 to 60, uh, 64 and for adults uh, 65 plus. Uh, so they want us to look at the 24 hours of our day and to think about in terms of physical activity, um, performing a variety of types and intensities of physical activity, uh, which would include moderate to vigorous aerobic physical activity, such that there is an accumulation of at least 150 minutes per week. So we'll chat about what that means, moderate to vigorous, and what to do if 150 minutes sounds really overwhelming, sounds like a lot of movement. Uh, that we should have some muscle strengthening activities using our big muscle groups at least twice a week, and uh, that we want to have some physical activities that challenge challenge our balance, uh, that we want to have several hours of light physical activities, including standing. Um, and then for our sleep, uh, getting seven to eight hours of good quality sleep on a regular basis with consistent bed and wake up times. So that sometimes gets more challenging as we get older, but I know sleep hygiene is a, a topic they cover in pulmonary rehab, looking at different ways that we can try to promote a better sleep. Uh, and then that sedentary behavior. So limiting that sedentary time um, as well. So no more than three hours on our screens and breaking up long uh, periods of sitting as often as possible. So trying to have not more than eight hours of sedentary time in our day. So if you feel safe to stand up and you didn't stand up earlier, you can maybe just do one stand to break up that sitting and then sit yourself back down. Awesome. Okay, so I wanted to go a little bit more into detail about some of these. Um, so the types of exercise that they highlighted there was some light physical activity, some aerobic exercise, uh, that we should accumulate 150 minutes in a week, muscle strengthening and physical activities that challenge our balance. So being physically active is safe for most uh, people. Um, so for example, the World Health Organization says that if we're, for most people, if you're doing physical activity below the level of a brisk walk, so that light physical activity, um, that most people are safe um, to do that. Uh, but we do need to be mindful um, that some people, because of um, either they're newer in dealing with their respiratory condition, they haven't been through pulmonary rehab and had some guidelines from their doctor, um, physiotherapist, respiratory therapist about how to manage their, their breathing with exercise. Uh, maybe you have um, had some trouble with your heart, some trouble controlling your blood pressure. Uh, that there's some people that maybe should be checking in with their doctor um, or another health practitioner who's licensed to diagnose or qualified exercise professional before they become more active. Uh, if you're ever curious to uh, do a questionnaire on your own, you can Google for PARQ Plus, uh, and that's the physical activity readiness questionnaire. And it kind of goes through some questions and tells you um, whether or not you're somebody that should maybe be talking to a health professional before you uh, get more active. Uh, your doctor or um, a health professional might tell you um, that they want you to monitor your blood pressure, your heart rate, or your oxygen um, saturation with activity. And that's um, something uh, that we do at pulmonary rehab. So unfortunately, I can't see the whole group on my screen because I see my slides, but I'm just curious um, how many of the group um, have been through a pulmonary rehab just by a show of hands, maybe Alexis and then can see. 
hopefully a number of you have had the chance to, to do so. I see Lindsay nodding, um, so that's great. Uh, so we did have uh, a query about a pulse oximeter. So um, Maggie, I hope you're online today, but if not, she'll be able to see the recording hopefully. Uh, she asked about pulse oximeters. So she said, what is the best way to use pulse oximeters? Should I uh, use it at a regular time? Oops, sorry. A uh, regular time, um, for example, after getting up in the morning or after exercise, has there been any research in this field? The manual that came with my pulse oximeter focuses how to get a correct reading, but nothing about the best time to use it. So I wanted to make sure we answered that. So uh, a pulse oximeter is uh, a little tool. I have mine here, just that's very similar to the one in the picture, or you might have, um, you guys can see my little, my little picture, you might have tried a big one like this up at the hospital for a walk test. Uh, so it's uh, usually a handheld device, uh, unless it's the big one the nurses have that's also incorporated into a blood pressure cuff and all sorts of things that they roll around on a cart. Uh, and it gives us two readings. It gives us a reading of our heart rate and a reading of our oxygen saturation. So there's a little picture there of a finger at the bottom and it's showing two little, two little arrows so there's a light source and it shines a light through our fingertip and the device analyzes the light that's passing through our fingertip tip to determine the percentage of oxygen in our red blood cells. So the machine does that by measuring the changes in light absorption between our oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So at two different wavelengths um, and calculates um, the ratio of these is calculated and compared to measurements of arterial oxygen saturation to achieve the pulse oximeter's measure of arterial saturation. So lots of fancy uh, stuff going on in there, but really easy for us to use, thankfully. Uh, it's been a really nice tool. And I find a lot of people, um, now that people pick them up at London Drugs, at Walmart, online, a lot of people have a basic pulse oximeter um, at home have picked one up. And uh, so we said that we can use this pulse oximeter to know our heart rate and to know a bit about our oxygen saturation. Um, so one time our, our Maggie asked, when might you use it? Um, so in terms of physical activity, uh, it is nice to use it before activity um, to have a look at where your oxygen levels are at and where your heart rate is at. Um, generally speaking, a normal heart rate range is between 60 and 100 beats per minute at rest. Um, some people who take heart, heart pills, drugs that end in OLOL, like metoprolol, bisoprolol, uh, those beta blocker medications um, may have you at a lower heart rate than 60, but for most people, between 60 and 100 beats per minute is a normal um, range. So we could see where is my heart rate before I start activity. If you're above 100, it might not be a safe time to start activity. Uh, and uh, we can look at the oxygen saturation number. So a normal oxygen saturation for healthy people should be between 95 and 100%. Uh, we know that patients with a reading so SpO2 is just a short form for oxygen saturation. Uh, so patients with that oxygen saturation reading of less than 90% are said to be hypoxemic. So we, that's considered low. So often we're wanting people's oxygen to be at at least 90% um, before we start uh, doing activity, okay? And then we also, we might measure during our activity if we find we get really short of breath and you're wondering, is that my oxygen that's low? Is that why I'm feeling short of breath or is something else going on? And we'll talk about some of the other things that might be going on uh, that would make a shorter breath that is not um, just our oxygen being low. Um, so you may wanna check just to reassure yourself, is my oxygen okay? Is my reading higher than 90% while I'm doing doing exercise. Uh, so you can check during, and then you can check after 
um, your activity as well. So if maybe you drop a little bit during activity, but you don't drop below 90 and you just wanna see how well you recover or you wanna use that per slip breathing um, that we talked about and to see how that helps bring your numbers back up um, at, the, at the end of activity. Um, so another time is afterwards. Uh, other times they do use these devices, like if you show up at emergency, if you show up for um, a walk test in the respiratory department. So they, one way they'll look at whether you need supplemental oxygen is what does your oxygen reading look like at rest? Uh, and then they might have you do a six minute walk test in the hallway where you're walking as many laps as you can of a 30 meter course um over a six minute period and seeing what happens to your oxygen reading so if your oxygen drops below 80 percent uh during that test you would qualify to be on oxygen uh and then there's a little gray zone kind of in the middle i'll call it a gray zone where you're below you're above 80 but below 90 um where they might uh put you on some supplemental oxygen and have you repeat the test and see if you can get 25% uh, further uh, than you got on the initial test and have your number stay a little bit higher, um, then you might qualify for exertional um, oxygen only. So that's another time where they might check um, oxygen saturation. Lindsay, did you wanna add anything to that? Cause it's really the RTs that are doing that testing and not physios like myself. Yeah, just um, uh, with the pulse oximeter and the use, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that we need to remember. Um, the first is, is what we consider normals to be, right? Because when we have COPD or we have asthma or something going on with our lungs, our normals are going to be different. So as Alana said, your, your oxygen saturation should be 95 to 100 for normal. If we see 100, we think that it's actually false because the way this de device works is it tells you how much of your hemoglobin that carries your oxygen is bound to something and how much of it is not bound. So your maximum should be about 98% bound to something, okay? When we have COPD um, and we know that our lungs are not working like somebody, like Alexa, little girl who she's folding right now, who hasn't had a smoking history, hasn't had lung infections or anything like that, we expect her normals to be anywhere between 92 and 98. But if we have COPD, um, anything greater than actually 88 is acceptable. We're all right with that number. So it's a little bit lower than what Alana says. One big thing when you're using it is that I want you to, um, if you're using it at home, it can be easy to fall into the habit of using the pulse oximeter all the time and checking to see what our numbers are and starting to panic a little bit, right? So um, if you're on oxygen at home, it's great to check it after exercise or if you feel short of breath or if you know that you're starting to get sick. Um, and that's part of the COPD action plan that we'll talk about. So it's important to use it then. But if you're using it while you're walking around, they are sensitive to motion. So they may not give you an appropriate reading. The other thing is that if you hit your thumbnail or you hit your finger and you have blood underneath your fingernail bed or you have nail polish or something is impeding your nail bed from being clear, the reading may be negatively impacted as well. So you have to make sure that the conditions you're using the pulse oximeter in is accurate. Um, <clears throat> let me just check the notes that I wrote on this to make sure. Uh, uh, that leads well into the slide that I had about factors that could <laughs> cause inaccurate or unreliable reading. So if you have poor circulation, mm -hmm. um, if you tend to be really white in the tips of your fingers or if your temperature is cool. So we do walking with our pulmonary rehab group inside uh, a hockey arena. Uh, and when the ice is in there in the winter, in the summer, they have it out for the cross. But when it's in there, uh, if people, some people, if they don't have gloves on, um, their hands are cold, you know, so uh, we're not getting an, an accurate reading at that time. Uh, some people, if they are getting uh, gel nails put on, especially dark colored ones, so purple or red or dark polishes, um, more on the women than the men. I don't see the men with it quite so often, but uh, they, um, they may have trouble getting the readings. Uh, if you're anemic, 
um, because we, if your hemoglobin is actually low, uh, tobacco usage, and that is because uh, there is carbon monoxide. Um, so if you're somebody with COPD that's still smoking, uh, there is uh, carbon monoxide um, in the cigarettes and uh, carbon monoxide really likes to bind to our, um, our hemoglobin and it's better at binding than our oxygen. So it might be reading, the machine might be reading the pulse oximeter that um, you know, your hemoglobin is really saturated, but instead of being saturated with oxygen, it's saturated with um, carbon monoxide. So that can throw off our readings. Like she said, if we're really moving around, um, so I find the more relaxed your hands is and the less movement, the better the reading that you'll get. And then sometimes depending on your skin color, um, that may affect the reading a little bit as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's really important to, you know, not to, like Lindsay said, not to panic if you're seeing a lower, a lower reading. Um, is it actually truly low or is, is there maybe one of these other things going on that's causing an inaccurate or unreliable reading? And the last thing I would add to that question is when you when is the best time to use it? Um, like Alana said, after exercise, I think it's really like it'd be a good time to see really how much the exercise that you just did or the physical activity has depleted that oxygen reserve in your lungs and then see how quickly you come up. OK, but you should come up. You may have to stop and catch your breath and do your breathing exercises, but that would be a good time, too. So you get an idea of what kind of what activity does to your oxygen levels. OK, thanks, Alana. You're welcome. So hopefully that answered um, answered the question well for uh, the person that asked. If you still have more concerns or questions, you can type it in the chat and let us know. Um, so just in terms of improving our shortness of breath, um, I think uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about shortness of breath and oxygen. Um, so that we know that people with COPD in particular, um, that they can have more air in their chest at the end of their exhale. So when you're doing those breathing tests uh, with our respiratory therapist, those spirometry tests or pulmonary function tests, and they you know, get you to take a big breath in and then blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're looking to see how much air is uh, still kind of left in our lungs. So we never fully empty, even a healthy person never fully empties our lungs. Um, so the air that's left is called our residual volume. Um, and people with COPD, their damaged airways tend to close down a little bit early, uh, leaving some of that air trapped in their lungs, creating what we call hyperinflation. Uh, and that can be worse during activity. Um, so it makes our work of breathing um, greater, um, that makes the muscles in the chest wall. If our, now our, um, our chest wall tends to expand front to back a little bit more um, than it would in a healthy pair of lungs when that air is always trapped in there. Uh, and we get our diaphragm flattening out a little bit. So it's uh, in a less efficient position. Um, so those, those respiratory muscles, whether it's the diaphragm or some of the ones in the chest wall may operate a little bit less efficiently. Uh, so it's not always that we're short of breath because we don't have enough oxygen. It may be that hyperinflation is happening. Um, and that is partly why, uh, you're feeling more short of breath, particularly with activity. And some, one of the ways we can reduce that amount of air trapping is to use that per slip breathing, that puckering as we, um, as we exhale to help create a little bit of back pressure, keep those damaged airways uh, open a little bit longer. So more of that carbon dioxide, more of that bad air um, can get out so we get a better breath of oxygen in um, the next time. Uh, the fitter we are, so the better aerobic fitness we have, um, we might feel less short of breath. Um, just like we said before, somebody more fit going up the stairs feels less short of breath than somebody that's less fit. And the other thing that might help um, is using uh, what is often called our rescue inhaler uh, or bronchodilator. So they uh, inhalers that help open up our airways um, before activity. Sometimes that can help reduce our shortness of breath um, as well. So 
that would be inhalers like your Ventolin, your Atrovent, for some people their combi vent um, that help open up our airways before activity. So most of those take uh, about five minutes to take effect, peak effect, usually 15 to 30 minutes. So we want to uh, take it a little bit before starting exercise and see, um, see if that uh, helps you feel less short of breath while you exercise. Um, does everybody know what aerobic exercise is? Maybe you think of Jane Fonda when you think aerobic exercise, uh, but it's a lot more than a lot more than that. Uh, so it's any exercise that uses our um, or exercises that use our big muscles of the body in a rhythmic way are generally um, can be classified as aerobic activities. Those so things like walking, um, like biking, like cross country skiing, like swimming. So we're we're using. Um, two or four limbs with the big muscles in a rhythmic way. Uh, we said the goal um, from the Canadian Society for um, Exercise Physiologists is 150 minutes. So Health Canada says we want to get 150 minutes of that aerobic type activity in our week. If you look at the World Health Organization guidelines, um, they push it up to all the way up to getting um, 300 minutes uh, in our week if we can um, safely do that. Uh, you have, uh, you can do it continuously. So you can do say a block of 20 or 30 minutes if you have the tolerance. Um, or we know that you can also do intervals. So maybe you're somebody that can do 30 seconds or a minute and then you need a rest. And if you rest and then you can do another 30 seconds or a minute. So move, rest, move, rest. Um, that as long as we can add that up, um, so maybe you're moving a minute, resting a minute, moving a minute, resting a minute. If we can still uh, get 10 minutes or 20 minutes of the movement in there. So it's going to take you a little longer to get your exercise done because you need that time for the rest periods. Uh, it's still valuable. You still can get a really big benefit um, for your heart and lungs that way. So that is often a nice way to start out. Um, if you find that you get shorter breath quickly is to start out with shorter intervals with periods of rest in between. Uh, and then moderate to vigorous intensity is the wording that they used. And uh, one way we can judge what the intensity of our exercise is using uh, what they call the scale of perceived exertion. So um, it's a zero to 10 scale. Uh, sometimes it's called the Borg scale. Uh, and what we can do is we can ask ourselves. Um, zero is uh, no breathlessness, no shortness of breath, um, none at all. And 10 is the worst you can imagine, maximal. Um, how short of breath or how fatigued uh, do you feel? And generally between a three and six on that chart. So if you're feeling moderate, uh, somewhat severe, severe, uh, some of the charts, instead of the word severe, we'll use the word heavy. So moderate, somewhat heavy, heavy, more heavy. Uh, in that three to six zone, that generally corresponds to people's aerobic zone for activity. So that's a really good target for activity is to feel um, just a moderate uh, level of exertion as a starting point, and then uh, building towards being four, five, probably not more than six, especially initially starting out with exercise, because uh, at those higher intensities, uh, we're more likely to run into, run into trouble. Have people used that, that scale before? Are they familiar with it? So that's a really nice tool because sometimes we said like people's hands are cold. We can't get their heart rate very well from the device or maybe heart rate is affected by medication or maybe your heart rate is affected by, um, uh, by how stressed you feel or by coffee you had earlier or how much sleep you had. So sometimes heart rate isn't a great tool to judge people's exercise intensity. Um, so it's nice to be able to use um, a scale like this perceived exertion scale to help you judge your exercise intensity. Some people, especially in the earlier stages of your disease, might be able to use what they call the talk sing test. So in your warm up, maybe you have enough uh, breath to sing a song. Uh, in the harder part of your exercise, you have enough um, breath to talk uh, and that you know that you need to slow down if you need to speak like that, like very choppy, or you can't get the words out. Uh, that gets a little trickier as we get sometimes further into um, our disease process of COPD. 
um, that perceived exertion scale might work better for you than the top test um, because it does it does uh, does get tricky. What's a normal symptom? So let's move again. We won't move too much, but let's just do a little, maybe a little march, just for a few seconds. Breathing in through our nose, out through first lips. If marching doesn't work for your hips, you can also just go up onto tippy toes and maybe lift your arms or bend your elbows if that feels better for you. So if we kept doing that for a little bit, you can take a break. What we normally should feel during activity is maybe light to moderate breathlessness. So that lower, those lower ends of the scale. If we did that long enough, we might start sweating a little bit. Uh, if you're, particularly if you're new to doing activity or doing new activities, you might feel a fatigue or a little bit of burning in your legs from doing the work. Uh, and sometimes we may have a little bit of light muscular or joint pain and light is kind of the key term there. We don't want any uh, severe pain there. We don't want pain that's outside of an ex what they say an acceptable level. So if you think of the traffic lights, green, yellow, red, that's the way our orthopedic surgeons sometimes describe it. Uh, stop at yellow. We don't wanna be pushing into the red, uh, red zone of pain in terms of, in terms of joint pain with activity. So if you don't experience any of those symptoms when you're working out, maybe you're not working out quite hard enough, maybe you could, you could push it just a little bit more. Uh, and if you experience other signs uh, like intense joint pain, chest pain, a dizziness, heart palpitations or feeling like your heart's fluttering, uh, headaches, or you feel uh, that you just can't get control of your breathing, um, then you need to stop your activity. And if those symptoms aren't going away, you may need to seek uh, medical attention. Okay, so those are signs of trouble. So if you are doing a lot more exercise um, these days online over Zoom, alone at home following a video, um, less class-based because of COVID, a lot of times people are doing a lot more at home or on their own, not in supervised settings. And um, those are the signs um, to watch for. Those are sort of our, our red flags of trouble, okay? Uh, we talked already about um, per slip breathing. Um, so it's just showing, inhaling through our nose if we can, out through purse lips. Uh, sometimes during exercise, you may have a harder time always pulling in air through your nose. Um, you may find that you also need to use your mouth depending on um, how hard your exertion is and that's okay. Um, but if we can, we like to use our nose because it filters the air, warms the air. Um, Lots of uh, good things happen with breathing in through our nose versus breathing in through our mouth. So when we can, breathing in through our nose and then out through purse lips, um, particularly to help those with COPD, but again, not quite as effective on um, that purse slipping for uh, interstitial lung disease and asthma. What if you do some new exercise uh, and you get really short of breath? Uh, how can you recover? Uh, so hopefully those that said that they did pulmonary rehab reviewed the SOS for shortness of breath. Uh, so stop. So that's number one. Just give yourself permission to stop what you're doing. Rest in a comfortable position. It takes a lot less energy um, to sit than to stand. So sit yourself down if you can. Uh, start slowing that exhale if you can, particularly if you have COPD, slowing that exhale blowing out through pursed lips. You're breathing in however you need to at first, whether that's in through your nose and your mouth together, just to feel like you're getting the air in, but out through pursed lips. Eventually you wanna breathe in through your nose and out through pursed lips. And then once you've gained control of your breathing, that would be a good time to think about taking your rescue inhaler if you have one, uh, and then deciding whether you feel safe to continue with your activity and maybe just at a little bit lower intensity. So maybe this time you move a little bit slower, um, you allow yourself more breaks so that you don't get quite as short a breath as you did um, the time before. So those pictures just show some of the relaxed positions you can get into. So sitting down, sitting, leaning forward, 
standing leaning forward, backwards leaning against a wall. We wanna anchor our arms um, because we said we have breathing muscle of our diaphragm and then muscles that attach from our neck uh, to our first rib. And so whenever we anchor our arms, we can use some of those accessory breathing muscles, just like a sprinter in the Olympics, you'll see them at the end of the race, bend over and take those deep breaths. Uh, we we want to use those accessory breathing muscles um, as well, pull those in to help us out to catch our breath. So that is why we're anchoring the arms, maybe on our on our knees or on forward on a table um, in front of us, so that we can uh, use use all of our breathing muscles to help us catch our breath. A uh, common thing that we see is before breathing is under control, people are trying to squirt their inhaler in. Um, no spacer, just grab that ventolin, that atrovent, give it a shake, and they're trying to, um, you know, trying to catch their breath and figure that that might help them out. Um, but uh, our RTs suggest one, use that little spacer, that little arrow chamber. So you, especially when you're that short of breath, so you don't have to time so well um, the breath and the press. Uh, and if your breathing really isn't under control, you can imagine that not much of it is gonna get down into your lungs if you're taking those shallow, quick breaths because you show shorter breath, it's gonna end up on your tongue, it's gonna end up in the back of your throat, um, which puts you at risk for more side effects. So increasing your heart rate and things like that. So just take that extra um, minute or two to get your breathing a little bit under control. And then uh, once you're under control, taking that inhaler, if you're still feeling that tightness, if you're still feeling the need uh, to take it. Alana, can I just interrupt? We're just, yeah. to, just to be aware of the time, it, we're, we're supposed to be done at three. Oh. Uh, we can push to 3.15, but we still have some questions to go okay. through. I'm not certain what you have left to go through. Yeah, let's skip right through to one of the questions, other questions. Okay, that sounds that. good. <clears throat> um, so I know you, we covered the pulse oximeter, which was great. Um, so I'll just read off the first question or do you, do, do you have it built in? I have one of them built in. Okay. Uh, right here. And everyone, this presentation will be posted. So if there's things that we had to skip through, it will be available for you to review. Okay. Uh, so one question we had was, can you tell me if the barometric measures affect breathing? Um, or if there's any other conditions that affect breathing. I'm stage three COPD. I'm asking because sometimes late at night, it's easier to breathe, much easier. And the other day I had a whole day of easier breathing. Um, as for general weather or climate, my COPD has gotten much worse since I moved back to the island from downtown Vancouver where I live for 10 years. Uh, so I had to look this one up. I know lots of people do report um, that they, you know, their breathing changes as our weather's changing, that they kind of feel the storms coming in or things like that. Um, so I did find that there was a study done in Norway in 2016 and published in 2020. Um, they looked at adults age 40 to 60 with and without lung disease. Um, and they found that atmospheric pressure at sea level was associated with oxygen saturation. So a reduction in atmospheric pressure um, but wasn't uh, associated with increased shortness of breath. So they saw that they got a 1% reduction in oxygen saturation with a, a, a particular drop in barometric pressure. So a drop of 1.66.67, um, which is similar from going from sea level to going up to an altitude of um, 1,400 meters. So we can see a little bit of a drop in um, oxygen saturation, but in this particular study, they didn't find that that 1% reduction was associated with increase in shortness of breath. So I don't know if, if anybody else has seen other research, but it's definitely something subjectively that we hear a lot, but not, um, I haven't seen a lot of research on it. Um, I'll just add into that. If the barometric pressure increases, it means that there's more pressure pushing down. And so oxygen is 21% of the air that we breathe. And so if there's a higher pressure, there's more 
it's the same ratio, but it's a higher amount. So that's why Alana said that the oxygen saturation in your blood can increase. So that's part of it. Another part of it, it could be accounted by the amount of moisture that's in the air. So if you know, you're getting to have a rainy day and the humidity is higher, air can actually feel thicker. If you've ever gone to a tropical place that's closer to um, a water source or a large body of water, the air is actually thicker because there's more moisture in the air and it can actually impact how it feels to breathe. So that can be what Alana said, one of those subjective um, components to an increase in barometric pressure. The other part of this question was uh, related to weather kind of climate and COPD feeling as though it's gotten worse since you've moved from the island into Vancouver. And that's thinking about, you know, the environments that you're living in. On the island, did you have fresh airflow? Was there less traffic? Was there less um, density for demographics and population? And then you move to a big city where there's more vehicles on the road, there's more population, more pollen perhaps. So there's a lot of components when you move from city to city that can make your COPD feel like it's not as controlled. And if you're feeling that way, definitely reach out to your healthcare provider. See if perhaps you need new testing or your medications need to be changed to accommodate for that new, um, the new city that you're living in. I don't know, Alexa, if you wanna add anything in or Alana. Yeah, just a lot of environmental factors. Um, yeah, between the two cities. So we know sometimes, you know, heat, humidity and rain, cold can be a trigger for bronchospasm. So whether the weather is, you know, between say that Okanagan and Victoria in the winter, that would be quite different. I'm not sure between Vancouver and Victoria. Um, smoke, the road dust. Um, so we in the valley get a lot of problems with road dust um, in the springtime with being caught in. So that might be a I'm not sure if that's a difference in Vancouver versus Victoria. Um, we get um, problems with snow mold here. Some people notice. Um, so lots of lots of uh, different factors might be playing into uh, not only barometric pressures but um, to the different environments. Um, next question. I think this was a fresh one for you, Alana. But okay. the question was. In the absence of an oxygen tank, what is the best supplement for better oxygen intake while on a trip outside of my residence, like on a cruise? Will deep breathing do the job? By the way, I do use oxygen only when my oxygen saturation is below 90. Portable oxygen concentrators are not available from Vital Air, which is their supplier. Um, I can answer this one too okay. if um, there's other stuff, but do you want to put anything into the answer first? Um. I can, I can let you run with it. It's it certainly, um, yeah, it it's depends how it's de described. Yeah. For the prescribed for that individual. Um, normally, you know, normally either people are prescribed oxygen to have all the time or people are prescribed oxygen to have only on exertion. Whereas maybe that's where the person is saying their oxygen drops below 90%. Yes. Um, it's not meant to be something where it's just kind of on, off, on, off, um, you know, so, it you know, hopefully that person has, has qualified for auction based on their blood gas or based on what those numbers were mm -hmm. um, and that it's, it's been prescribed appropriately for them and, and following that prescription. So I think that's great. I was going to echo that as well. If it's supplemental oxygen, either you wear it all the time or you wear it when you move around. Um, it's unfortunate some of the oxygen providers have different equipment. It's just what it is. Um, if you're on a cruise, there's breathing exercises can help you clear more air. So you're breathing in fresh air and getting rid of that old stale air that you've already used the oxygen from. But if you do require that oxygen, breathing techniques are not going to take place of that, unfortunately. Um, there are portable oxygen concentrators that you can purchase privately. So if Vital Air doesn't have one for you to use because you're through the home oxygen program, then you can choose to purchase one privately. You can, they could order it for you, I'm assuming, or other suppliers, but they are pretty pricey. A lower end model starts at about $1,500 and they can go anywhere up to 3000 or 4500 depending on battery life that you want, spare batteries and that kind of thing. So uh, in this situation, um, I don't recommend going on a trip without your supplemental oxygen. Please don't put yourself in a situation where you may need it and then it's not available to you or it cuts your trip short. 
but you could look into um, speaking with your provider and seeing if they can give you quotes on purchasing a portable one. They're great. They're usually a demand system. So when you breathe in, that's when you get the oxygen. So it, it uh, preserves the battery life a little bit longer, but um, yeah, that's what I would say yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. They definitely have some limitations depending what the person's used to using. So those portable concentrators, like Lindsay was saying, not you might only be able to get two liters continuous out of it, depending on the model. Then you have to use it on pulsed. And is that enough for you? Are you able to trigger that that pulse flow? Is it gonna is it gonna meet your needs? So you'd want to establish that before you before you go away. Um, next question. Yeah. If you have a respiratory virus, should you exercise or should you wait? Generally speaking, uh, if you're in a flare-up, um, we want to uh, depending depending where you're at, uh, stop um, your activity for the first bit. Um, there are guidelines for um, returning, or you you might be able to speak to your um, your health provider and see. So it's a little bit individual. Um, you might um, be able to continue with a light bit of activity um, while um, while you're sick. So for example, when people are at the even at the hospital where we're helping them with their secretion clearance and things like that. So we're wanting people to get up and get moving. We know that if we just don't move, um, we quickly lose, um, lose our strength. Um, so we want to incorporate some movement for sure, um, but we may want to scale back that more vigorous um, exercise. So we talked about three to six on the scale. Um, maybe you're not going above three. Maybe you're keeping everything at a very moderate intensity. You're allowing yourself more breaks, um, assuming you're still able to keep your oxygen up. Generally speaking, like we don't exercise while we have fever. Um, so it just depends on exactly what your symptoms are. But we generally want to keep active, uh, keep it at a lower intensity uh, for strength, scale back your repetitions. And if you are, are really sick, um, you know that you're not maintaining your oxygen saturations or um, you know you just you're you're not getting good control of your breathing um, you have a fever those are times when we can it's okay to rest for a couple of days and allow your your body to recuperate and then step back think into things lightly and if you did have a um, a more severe exacerbation it can sometimes take up to about a month to kind of step back to your full program i think that's great Next question came from Ted, and I think I'll just field this one. Um, Ted was asking what the PI percentage is on a pulse oximeter. So when we're in hospital, we can actually see a waveform and it tells us how good the blood flow is in the finger that we have our, our probe on. You don't have that visual representation with the pulse oximeters that are purchased for, or for home. So the PI is actually your perfusion index. So it tells you the quality of blood flow in the finger that you've chosen to put on. Generally, the range is about 0.02% all the way up to about 20%. So the higher the number, the better the blood flow in that finger. And that's what you want, Ted, is to have a really high number, that percentage to be as high as you can. Um, so if your fingers are really cold, it might be a low percentage. So a warm blanket or try and find a finger that has that best number on there. And then you can feel, um, better about the reading that you're getting that it's actually a good reading. Does that make sense? Good, thank you. Um, and then that tags into another question about, well, where should you put the pulse ox energy? Should you put it on your left hand, your right hand, your thumb, your middle finger? Um, what we like to recommend is try and start by putting it on your non-dominant hand, first of all. But if that doesn't work, any finger's gonna be fine. We tend to put it on a larger nail bed so that we get as much um, capillary blood flow as we can. So the thumb will work, the index finger or the middle finger or the ring finger really. But we try and make sure that we get that best blood flow. If you're not getting a good reading and you look at it and you see a low number and you think, oh my goodness, this isn't what I think it should be, try another finger, you know, correlate it between hand to hand to see if your numbers are matching up. Because maybe one hand is cold and one is warm and, and the warm gives you a better number. It, you can get a false negative, but you can't get a false positive. 
Um, <clears throat> so I hope that answered that one. And then there's the last question, and Alana, you probably can tag in on this one as well. Um, I have been suggested, or it's been suggested that I suffer from pulmonary hypertension. How can I improve this without oxygen? So I, I can answer this one as well, Alana, or do you have any um, experience with pulmonary hypertension? Uh, just as a, just as an, an additional diagnosis on top of um, having having COPD or another another condition. And that's actually a really good way. So there's two types of pulmonary hypertension. There's primary or idiopathic, and then there's secondary pulmonary hypertension. So that primary one, nobody knows why you have pulmonary hypertension, but you have it. Secondary pulmonary hypertension will come from a lung disease like Alana said, like COPD or uh, pulmonary fibrosis, or it can come from heart problems as well. So it depends on what type of you have. And if it's secondary, then obviously whatever's causing it, let's try and treat it. But sometimes it requires that the patient be on oxygen and there's just no other treatment. The reason why um, oxygen is given as a treatment is if you remember back from one of our first presentations, we've got our lovely little alveoli, right? Our little air sacs at the end of our airways. And they are wrapped with all those little blood vessels. So when we have hypertension, the speed of the blood flowing through those vessels increases. So instead of driving down the road at 50, we're going at 120, like we're on the Coquihalla. So when we go really fast, the blood doesn't have enough time. Uh, Doreen, I see you laughing at me, stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> when we, the blood goes faster, there's less time for it to reach out and pick up that oxygen. So the amount of blood or oxygen that's in our blood is actually lower. So by giving you supplemental oxygen, it increases the percentage of oxygen that's in the air you breathe. So then we can try and give you as much oxygen as we can while that blood is still going past the airway or the little air sacs really quickly. Does that make sense? And I forget whose question it was. It's me, Rick, thank you, yeah. Does that make sense, Rick? Yeah, like at rest, my I'm I'm about 94, 95. Yeah. But as soon as I start to exercise, I bail, and uh, and I've always wondered why. Yeah. I'm in shape, I, and I'm out of breath, but it, that's why. But uh, yeah, and don't be ashamed. You're out of breath because of what's going on. So don't feel like you're doing something wrong at all. Um, when you start doing exercise, your heart rate goes up. So now yeah. that blood that's going even faster. Than normal people, it's going even faster because your heart's making it go even faster. Those little blood vessels that are tight that cause the blood to speed past, yeah. now the heart's pushing it even faster. So it's like a double double whammy against you. Yeah, and I do I do have uh, 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 heart disease. You do okay. From so birth, yeah, be, yeah, a secondary. So then, just making sure that you're staying on top of like optimizing your heart, and then just listening to your body. Do not push yourself to a point that you get into trouble yeah it's kind of hard sometimes because i like recently joined a boxing club and uh i i i can't do it it's just too much for me but uh um i want to keep going but i can't go at that level and it's just uh it's i don't know what to do so <laughs> i just um, it's important are you on oxygen at home? No, it was suggested that I try it, but I, I haven't because uh, I don't know. I, I can't see myself going to the doing exercise with oxygen on. Right. I just it's not going to work. But well, I've often wondered why I could be in shape. And then when I go do hiking or something like that, I, I, I'm the last at the pack. Right. Because I can't keep up. Yeah. And that's why. But. And um, so one of the and this is the it's an unfortunate thing that part of having so the blood is flowing quickly past, so it's not picking up, up as much oxygen. And one of the symptoms of having low oxygen in your blood is those blood vessels constrict and get even smaller, which speeds up the blood even faster. So if we can give you a bit of oxygen, maybe it'll relax those little blood vessels and slow down the speed of the blood going past your air sacs. And yeah. maybe that'll make you feel a little bit better. The thing is, it's a permanent thing though, right? Yeah, but maybe during exercise, if you use oxygen, it might actually help the symptom of feeling short of breath. 
Yeah. yeah. Something to think about. Something to think about for sure. And give it a try. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your insight. Of course. No problem. Uh, okay. So the last question, I sorry, I must have missed from Dwayne. Um, I have severe COPD and emphysema. I use a portable oxygen concentrator at four liters. When I exercise to keep oxygen levels, when I exercise to keep oxygen levels otherwise too short of breath, do I lose the benefit of exercise because of the machine? Duane, are you still on the call? Oh, sorry, you're muted. And I probably said your name. I bet it's Diane. It's not Dwayne. Yeah, it's Diane. It's Diane. My apologies. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Um, so yes, I, I use a, a portable concentrator uh, um, for liters. It's a it's pulse. Um, okay. So when I exercise, because I want to exercise, do cardio for for an hour. Okay. Uh, a bit like uh, like uh, thing. I, I I couldn't. I'd, I'd be out of breath after five minutes. But this way, at least I can um, I can do an hour's worth of exercise. Uh, but am I the exercise because I am having help with the concentrator? Sorry, that last part. Kind I of think she's asking, I think I caught it. Uh, okay. Are you losing the benefit of doing the exercise or some of the benefits of exercising by having supplemental oxygen on while you're exercising? Is that correct? Is that the question? Yeah, Yeah, I wouldn't say so. Alexa or Alana, um, please feel free to add in. I think as Alana um, has said multiple times, having doing exercise is amazing it's a medicine in its own so if the oxygen being added in allows you to do exercise then i think that's a great benefit but i'll let alana take this one yeah i i totally agree with lindsay uh, whether you're doing the exercise with oxygen um because you need it because otherwise your saturation would be too low uh or you're doing the exercise uh without you're still getting getting all those benefits. You're still getting benefits for your heart and lungs. And the oxygen for you sounds like it's just allowing you to exercise that much longer. So you're just getting you know, more benefit um, than you would get if you exercised a short period uh, because you had to stop without it. So yeah, keep using the oxygen and keep doing those long bouts of exercise. You're, you're doing yourself a great service by doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's not fun, but exercise is good for all of us. <laughs> ah, I say it is fun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like it. <laughs> I don't know. They had a lot of fun at Jill's classes, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. I, then I'm doing the wrong kind of exercise. For sure. <laughs> um, so that is all that I have for questions. We're a little late for time, so I might have to cut us short. But is there any last pressing questions from the group? Give me a head no or a head yes. I got notes, wonderful. Well then we'll call it for today. Thank you so much for everyone for attending. Um, Alana, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time today. It was great. Um, Thanks everybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I will, I know I had a question from Louise. I don't know if she's on oh. online. Um, just on the Facebook group, she was asking about um, uh, these devices. So, uh, airway oh. sort of clearance devices yeah. versus uh, devices for inspiratory muscle training. And we didn't get a chance to touch on it today. So I'll try to make a nice post on the Facebook group and we'll try to make sure we touch on that in, in a future discussion, um, which devices actually train your inspiratory muscles um, versus devices that are for secretion clearance or to encourage a deep breath uh, to give you visual feedback for a deep breath that aren't really designed uh, to train your muscles. So uh, we'll make sure we touch on that uh, through the Facebook group and some future talks. That's actually great, Alana, because our next webinar series, which is July 20th for the group, uh, is actually getting out the goop. It's the bronchial hygiene one. So okay. that'll, uh, great segue. I don't know how you did it, but good job. <laughs> 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 one